Fourteen and a half years ago, the gruesome murders of three eight-year-old boys shocked West Memphis, Arkansas. Stevie Branch, Christopher Byers, and Michael Moore, second grade playmates, were found beaten to death, naked and bound in shallow water. Police arrested three teenagers, including an alleged devil-worshipping ringleader named Damian Eccles. Eccles and 16-year-old Jason Baldwin denied involvement, but 17-year-old Jesse Miss Kelly confessed, telling authorities they killed the boys after a chance encounter in the woods. Miss Kelly, who defense attorneys claim has a low IQ, now says the confessions were coerced. So about a million years ago, I took the GRE to get into grad school, and man, was it tough. I really wish that I had the Princeton Review back then. The Princeton Review has all you need to prepare for SAT, ACT college entrance exams, or if you're getting ready for grad school, the Princeton Review can help you with your MCAT, GRE, GMAT, LSAT, and more. The Princeton Review has a personalized plan. There are traditional classroom courses or virtual classrooms where you get the same personalized instruction online, and they have self-paced courses too. The Princeton Review uses adaptive technology to pinpoint how you're doing in each area. In real time, their exclusive recommendation engine can guide you to where you need more work and save you time on parts that you've mastered. And if you've got a high schooler, or if you're getting ready for grad school, the Princeton Review has you covered. And here's a special offer for our listeners, $250 off any classroom course in person or live online. Go to theprincetonreview.com forward slash real crime to sign up. That's $250 off any classroom course. Go to theprincetonreview.com forward slash real crime. The Princeton Review is not affiliated with Princeton University. A small, quiet, residential neighborhood. The streets are lined with modest two- and three-bedroom homes from one end to the other. Back in 1993, and even today, you're not likely to drive these streets without crossing paths with dozens of children walking and riding bikes. And on May 5th of 1993, little eight-year-old Stevie Branch was one of these children. Hello and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is a very special episode. And my name is Jim Clementi, retired FBI profiler, former New York City prosecutor and writer-producer for CBS's Criminal Minds. And with me in the studio is... Laura Richards, former New Scotland Yard criminal behavioral analyst and founder of Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service. And I am Lisa Zambetti. I'm the casting director for Criminal Minds. And oh my God, I'm geeking out right now. I can't keep it together. We have somebody in the booth, but I'm just, oh my God. Anyway, yes. And, <laughs> and I'm sure you heard that laughter and you will recognize the voice of... I'm Bob Ruff, the host of the Truth and Justice podcast. And I'm, I'm quickly going to, I have to Snapchat where I'm at because I'm with three of my favorite people. Lisa and Laura and Jim. We didn't know that we would be. I know, uh, I know. This is not camera ready. No warning. Well, this is going to have a lot of surprises. Oh, it's gone. It's up there. (laughs) (laughs) This podcast is going to have a lot of surprises. So we are here to celebrate the fact that Bob is in town and he wanted to come by and talk to us a little bit about what he's been doing lately. What you been doing, man? Not Nothing? much from the sounds of it. No, just, just been kicking back. Making some podcasts. No big deal. Uh, yeah, we, we actually, as you guys know, took on a very challenging case, especially when we're doing a, you know, a crowdsourced investigation where we're inviting people to contribute. And we took on a case that's been picked over by millions of people over 25 years. Uh, and many of them are very excited to contribute in a lot of different ways. So it's been... It's been challenging, but also very rewarding so far, and we're really just just starting to dig our heels in now. And of course, we covered this case as well. I'm not in the depth that you've gone into it, but we did cover it earlier on with Real Crime Profile, and it certainly is a very controversial one. So the Um. current situation is this. Three eight-year-old boys were killed. They were thought to have been tortured and mutilated, and the police investigation went off in that direction. They arrested three teenage boys who were sort of outcast. They never looked back, did they, Bob? No, you know, at the very, there's a lot of misconceptions around the case. And and, and the reality is, it, to be fair, the police did, they did follow several different leads at the very beginning. 
Um, but but it's also, you know, and, and some people will point that out, that it was actually a more balanced investigation than you think. But the reality is, what you can't deny is the fact that Damian Eccles was prime suspect number one. We uncovered that on the podcast. The day the, the, day the bodies were found, uh, Steve Jones, juvenile probation officer, tells J- Lieutenant James Sudbury, you know, they both agreed this was a, a satanic killing, and they could only think of one person who would do that, and that's Damian Eccles. And 12 hours later, they were knocking on his door. Um, and so there was always that focus. And, and there there was more investigation. You know, they had actually conducted 41 polygraphs in this case. 13 people failed the polygraphs. And, and so I think that more of their focus on and tunnel vision on Damian Eccles caused them to rule out some suspects that they should have looked further at. And then, of course, caused them to never do what should have been done, which we all know is first place you look is start with the people closest to the victims and work out in concentric circles. And they never did that. Right. Well, victimology is the foundation of any child abduction investigation, child homicide investigation. And it seems like it didn't happen here. So I have to say that when I heard that you were doing this case, my heart sunk and leapt at the same time, if that's possible, Mm -hmm. because I knew what you were in for. I just knew based on what we went through with this case, the piling on of Noners and truthers and true noners and mm-hmm. and all those different camps right. that have come to conclusions. I don't through, even know what those things mean. I know. So. I don't even really know anymore either. I, and and I had this weird like listening to all of us. I don't know, Jim, if you have been listening all along, but I know I had not been listening until two days ago. Mm-hmm. So I've had to speed through all eighteen of your episodes in double time. Uh-huh. And you sound great as a teenage girl. You're like, <laughs> um, and anyway, wow, but but, <laughs> but listening uh, gave me deja vu and PTSD at the same time, uh-huh. because I went, we went down all the same rabbit holes that turned into wormholes that turned into mm-hmm. gopher holes. You think you're looking up just one little fact and it's, you can't find Spider out one little web. thing. Right. It, it's like, and then you're trying to verify this and then you get back like, why did I even want to know this? I don't even remember why <laughs> I wanted to know this, right. you know? This is one of these crazy cases that is just there no straight forward. It's all serpentine. And I was just listening to your Vic talk about victimology and just going through the last steps of the boys on that day. Uh-huh. Right. And you go through all of this effort, hours and hours trying to verify all of that. And we learned a whole lot of a lot of new things that I didn't know before. Uh-huh. And then at the end of the day, it's like, did this any of this matter? I mean, did any of the, does it matter that Chris didn't come home right away? There's an hour unaccounted for. Right. It seems like it should, but maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe it has nothing to do with anything. Well, sequence you know? of events. Sorry to jump yeah, in absolutely. rather than victimology. And victimology is absolutely critical. And yeah. as Jim said, that's exactly where you start. And I was so pleased to hear that, Bob. Mm-hmm. You know, you spent from one to eight, because mm-hmm. I also listened to you 24 seven for the last few days in my ear, <laughs> <laughs> in my new best friend going everywhere with me on my runs and yeah. with my puppy. And, um, you know, and I think you just did a fantastic job from certainly one to eight where you're, laying out what was known but certainly around the victimology where the gaps are and the sequence of events because as lisa said there's so many moving parts to this case and it's a huge case and also as lisa said so many people have such entrenched views right and they are absolute about their view and they normally start at the point with the suspect and then want to move everything to right exactly and that's unfortunately laura as we've seen and and i'm sure Bob, you've seen, unfortunately, that happens in law enforcement too. And it is absolutely 100% the opposite way an investigation should flow. You should absolutely let the evidence take you where it does and not try to force or find only evidence to support a theory or to support a particular person being the bad guy. Right. And that's, that's one thing that I've repeated over and over again is that evidence should drive theory and, it, and with so many uh, people that are just so deeply rooted for so long in in this case, it's the other way around, where their theory is driving the evidence, where they're being selective about which evidence you put out. And, of course, we're we're not putting out a lot of new evidence. It's just new analysis of what's out there and, and trying to take all of the, you know, there, there's, and as I'm sure your listeners already know, an amazing website, Callahan's, that has, you know, a lot right. of people put, oh. you know, that, that that's Callahan. not just that's, well, <laughs> How many hours of my life? Well, and imagine yeah. the people that built Absolutely. it. These are it's people incredible. that went to the evidence rooms and to the DA's office and hand copied and transcribed and put all the work into the website. It's an amazing resource. Wow. But but what hasn't you know happened, what we're trying to do is then to take all of that and say, okay, well, let, let's 
take these pieces that they provided and see if we can actually you know put them together into a narrative and figure out what happened. Uh, and and but that's been the one great part about having these listeners that are so entrenched is I know that if I need to know something about anything. And if I put it out, there are people listening that can tell me exactly, send me a link to Callahan's immediately. The bad side of it is a lot of people have already so entrenched themselves in their own theories that it's so, you know, you, you put out new evidence and, 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 and corroborate and, and, and put this whole package together to, to finally prove something that maybe was never proven before. And it's like, it's like banging your head against a wall with a lot of these people that they'll just, well, yeah, but what about... For example, the alibi, Damien's alibi that we just went through. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, some, somebody just on our on our not our fan page, but on our main page, had put up. Well, here at trial, the prosecutor asked Damien Eccles, you know, well, originally you said this uh, this trip went to the Sanders house happened at this time, right? And he's like, yeah. And then later you said this time, right? Yeah. And then and then later you moved it up and you stopped talking about it at all, right? You're just kind of moving it to try to cover the time you need to cover. He's like, and he he tells him, yes, sir. And, and so they're like, so see, obviously he did, he's lying about it, and I'm analyzing that completely yeah. differently. What I'm seeing is it's a guy that doesn't know when the hell the crime happened. You know, he he didn't know when to uh, to account for his time because he didn't didn't know when the crime occurred. And then furthermore, they go on to say, you know, after he was released from prison and his books and all that, he doesn't even talk about this the, this visit to the Sanders house, which you know we cover in detail on the podcast. Yeah. He's talking about being on the phone with these two girls all night, and that was his alibi. And they're CNC. Look, he he doesn't even think it was a good alibi. And look, he's it's it's all about these phone calls. And yeah, because he doesn't know when the murder happened. Because at his trial, the medical examiner said that the time of death was between one and five a.m., which I personally believe to be false. But uh, and, and then the pros- the prosecutor, which was another strange move. And Jim, as you as a former prosecutor, what do you think about him? presenting a narrative to the juror that was not in evidence. Well, that that's, uh, that's a very great way to have the defense win an appeal and get the case overturned mm-hmm. and have a new trial, which, you know, may have contributed to the fact that, that this case was actually headed for a new trial right. when the prosecutor sort of bulldozed these guys into doing the Alfred plea. I mean, two of the three wanted to do it. Damien was on death row, right? Mm-hmm. And... Um, and so he wanted to do it. He wanted to get off death row, and which which uh, was it? Um, Jason is the one that Jason didn't want to. Didn't didn't want to, and he basically got forced into it because the DA said, "Look, if all three of you don't do it, then none of you get it." Okay. And he didn't want to risk Damien being on death row. Mm-hmm. And they should have been able to get a new trial, and they should have had all this evidence reviewed. But now, as it stands. It's never going to happen. Hey, but he's alive. And I think that was, that's what it came down to. But let's, let's go back for a second. So you've had this great crowdsourcing uh, force. Your, your, what do you call it? They the, call it the truth and justice. The truth Army. And justice. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. And it's great. Cause one of their listeners actually did a visual mm-hmm. cause you were, you were breaking down the boys movements before they, they disappeared and it's so confusing. And so they did mm-hmm. like a visual animation right. and that, which Pretty is amazing. so, which is that, so helpful. Plea, you know, you request mm-hmm. somebody, somebody uh, listener, listening, Abby Scott, together. put that together together and it's amazing and it's great and, and again it's not really new information but it's seeing all the information instead of going to all the different callahan pages to have it all in right. one thing however the flip side of that like if i could think of a case that didn't need any more people weighing in on it who weren't there i would say it's this case so is there like you know like in the other cases you've covered you know crowdsourcing the information has been so important, but this case has had so many people like leaving their families to go to West Memphis mm-hmm. and investigate this. I mean, long before you did, I, you know, right. I know, many, many people who've taken decades of their lives yeah. to, to weigh in on this. So is there a flip side to that? There are, there's too much static. There's too much noise to really kind of get to what's important. It, it's hard to filter through. It really is. And, and luckily we have uh, an amazing set of admins on our fan page that try to filter through some things. We've got Chris who created the page and Jill and Elias and Holly um, who do a great job of, of managing and trying to filter through some things. Um, yeah, there's a lot of static and a lot of noise, but also those people that are so entrenched, you know, for me, a lot of it is trying to filter through what's assumption, what's perception and what's reality, and what's fact. And, and so the, they may come at me with, well, I have this theory and it's blah, 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 blah. And I, and, and I'm not sure that the theory doesn't make sense, but you said something in the middle of that, 
that's something that's a piece of evidence that I wasn't aware of. There's no way that I could keep uh, that I could catch up to these people this mm-hmm. quickly. Um, and, and so having all, you know, people that are, like you said, supporters and nons and whoever they are, having so many people that have knowledge of the case and being able to say, hey, I'm looking at, you know, for the recent episode, I want to know every single witness statement that, that says Damien is in a location on that day. Anyone, I don't care who it is. And I get, boom, there's a, there's a whole list. Because I was, you know, what they don't realize, I was creating a chart to try, you know, how many different places was he at each time. Right. Um, but there's no way because of the way, you know, like Callahan's is organized. It's organized by person, but it's not by subject. So I can't look up Damien's alibi. I have to, you have to know the name of the person you're looking for. Mm-hmm. And so it's, I think it's been worth it. I think that it's, it's, it's taken us some growing pains and, and we're learning how to work through this and fighting through some drama on Facebook and stuff. But, you know, I think, I think we're, we're, we're starting to get into a groove where we're, we're becoming the machine that we have been in previous seasons. Sure, sure. And this really is like a large scale investigation. We always say like our murder investigations, really a senior investigating officer is managing huge volumes of data right. and information coming at them. And it sounds like it's exactly the same as mm-hmm. what you're doing. So what are the processes you have in place? I.e., how do you decide, you know, what kind of matrix do you have to decide like tips coming in, you know, reliability, credibility, I know what we've used in the police, you know, we use a matrix, a five by five by five by five mm-hmm. matrix intelligence process to screen. Are you using anything like that, Bob, for the tips? And then, you know, what happens in terms of information coming at you from like Facebook of, uh, it may not be a tip, but it might be something that you want to follow up. So, so our, our matrix is really Mike Bussing, our producer, um, and my friend that works with me uh, many hours every week. So Mike is, the Matrix, who we hear Mike, on the follow-up. Mike yes, the week, Mike yeah. the Matrix. He's excellent, uh, by the way. Yeah, he he really is great. He's better than he thinks he is. Um, but, you know, he filters through the questions and come, decides what to ask on the follow-ups. Tips he will usually forward over to me. And, you know, it, really, I look – I, I just I, I screen through them what can be corroborated. You know, a lot of times you can pretty quickly say, you know, that's that's not accurate because you know we we just know it not to be accurate. And then other times we follow up on them. We catalog. Mike also does a good job of cataloging not only resources but um, tips that I want to keep a pin in that we need to come back to. Because at the same time, I'm trying to I'm trying to track. I don't want to get ahead of my. For example, when we did the the, the profile episode where we created a, a my, my amateur profile of the crime scene, I didn't want to dig into all the suspects before I did that. You know, so, so a lot of things were coming in, like, I think this person, this, this, I, I pushed those aside until after we got past that episode. Um, but we don't have a formal matrix or anything like that for me. It's just, I just, I, I, I look to see if they can be actually independently corroborated, if they're obviously false. And then the questions, that's all, all Mike. Mike figures out what would be, what are going to be relevant questions on the, on the follow-up? And, and sometimes I'll guide him in just in a way and say, you know what, after, you know, because you know how it is with the podcast, you record it well before it gets published. People seem to think we're sometimes like we're sitting in the studio on Sunday morning. We're not. It happened Tuesday. Um, and, you know, you think of something a few days later and I'll say, you know, hey, make sure that I want to talk about this subject. So Mike will find questions that have that subject to give me the opportunity to do it. But uh, we have also found that we're not good actors. So mm-hmm. I never know what Mike's going to ask me because when we first started the uh, the podcast, we would discuss the follow-ups before we record them and then try to act like it was new. And it never it, it doesn't work. No, yeah, it doesn't work you at can all. Tell. Yeah. Well, that's why, you know, we like to have a real discussion. That's why it's great to have you here. And mm-hmm. we're all really interested in hearing the process and what you're going through and also where you think it's going to head. But I did just want to say about the format, just, of, you know, I'm enjoying the way that it's being produced. Um, certainly having, you know, one of your episodes presenting sort of the evidence and the, uh, the, the way that you're thinking about the evidence and asking people to challenge your logic mm-hmm. um, in the way that you're coming to your uh, hypothesis to then come to your theory. There are certainly Clementiisms across this and, you know, absolutely right in terms of approaching it to be thorough and, you know, open-minded and have mm-hmm. people... Uh, challenge what you're thinking at the same time you certainly seem to be taking a very logical approach um i certainly enjoyed 510 and 511 so the medical evidence and i like the way that you interwove the things from the trial so Mm -hmm. you can hear firsthand so you reduce some of the i'm thinking this when people don't realize or know what it is that you've seen or heard to think that right Um, and i really like the follow-up where 
people are given your your audience are given a chance to ask the questions and then Mike will pose them to you but it's much more conversational style and much mm -hmm. more relaxed and I personally you know enjoy that format and the music to go with it so absolutely I think it's incredibly well produced that's such a gift to do too because you always think of things after ah damn I should have said this to Jim or whatever, right. you know. And so it's so generous, really, of your time to go back and sift through that and reframe your thoughts. Sometimes you correct yourself, right? And which is great. And then sometimes, and then you acknowledge your listeners, which is really fantastic to be able to well, do. Well, and what had happened is over time, as we got into more, you know, active investigations from the original Serial Dynasty to Truth and Justice, uh, it, I felt like we were losing the crowdsourcing bit of it, you know, there was like, cause I remember at the very beginning, I would always, I would read listener emails at the end of it and then answer those questions or put their theories out. And we had gotten away from that. And so then we, the addition of the follow-ups was to re-engage uh, the listener so yeah. that they could still be a part of it. Cause they've always have been a part of it. And, and I want to throw a big shout out to my man, Shane Yoder with put them in a song.com who does the music for our shows. Cause Which is excellent. he has taken it to the other show. He's also our sound engineer. He's the one that Mike, Mike produces and edits and, and gets everything to clean on the vocal side. And then he ships it off to Shane and Shane drops in all the music custom writes and scores the music wow. and sound engineers the episode every week. And That's it's just, it, it's, I think he's doing a phenomenal job. I Both of them are. Agree. Yeah. yeah, you've got a good team there putting it together, mm -hmm. and you know it's, it comes across as incredibly professional. Um, and you know you're taking it very seriously because mm -hmm. you are hoping to turn up new evidence and leads, and you know review all of the facts and hopefully come to a conclusion. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. I do have one criticism, and I can't believe I have to do this. Okay, bring it on. I really I care deeply for you, <laughs> <laughs> and it hurts me. It hurts me to do this. Um, when we were doing our investigation of the case, I specifically, and I think you guys, Jim and Laura did too, I stayed away from any interviews from the three convicted, uh, from uh, Damien Knuckles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Miskelly, uh, other than the documentaries. Uh, I didn't read their books. I didn't watch them on whatever, whatever, um, because I didn't want to be influenced by that because there's such a cult of personality around them uh -huh. for better or worse. So, you know, you do have a conversation with Damien Knuckles in uh, something I listened to this morning and I don't remember which episode it was, but it was about his tattoos and, uh -huh. and this and that. And part of me was like, mm, I, I wish, I kind of wish you hadn't done that because mm -hmm. I don't want, not that you would be, but you can't help it. You can't help but maybe have your biases shift. I mean, wouldn't you, wouldn't, would you agree with that? Well, Jim, at, at a certain point, but you know, certainly in the beginning, but these, if they are, guilty if Damien and the other two are guilty then doing interviews with them is it's just an unbelievable opportunity because we never get to talk to the defendant yeah. so there's that also by talking to them you can nail down very specifically things that did or didn't happen in their point of view and then you can corroborate or refute them so mm -hmm. it's a it's a incredibly important part of any investigation it's what the cops do so why wouldn't he do it because because i think it can you can but it depends what stage it. you're doing it as well yeah and so i don't know where your sequence was for. I well know. i was four months into the investigation at that point when i when i interviewed damien um for the first time which we as a, an interview people haven't heard yet and then that one was it was literally we're going through the, uh that evidence in that particular episode and it was like well this is what they're saying what does Damien say happened? And so we contacted him and he said, yeah, sure. I'll come on and talk about it. And so we, we got his side of it, but for, I mean, sure. You run the, the risk of that anytime, but I, I, I guess I would say that for me, it doesn't matter. I, I do this all the time yeah. with, with many people in many cases. And, you know, at some point you have to interview them. And, and I've always been very, very much evidence and database. So, you know, the, his, you know even if he was the most likable guy in the world, you know, it was Damien. I couldn't, I couldn't be more polar opposite people. Um, but that's fine with me. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. to me. But even if he was, you know, the, the best best guy I've ever met, and we were best friends, it doesn't matter because it's not going to change the evidence. Because I know from my own credibility, anything that I'm saying, I have to be able to back up by what's actually in the record. And you feel like you can stay neutral and and right. stay on track. Yeah, and also I've made no no secret about the fact that, especially up to where we're at now, that 
at this point in the investigation, I thoroughly, I thoroughly believe in their innocence. And, and so, yeah. So in that case, they become the victim of a wrongful prosecution right. and a wrongful conviction. So, I mean, and it's very important, obviously, to, to tell the victim story. There's there's six victims in this case so far. And then you, you know, you have concentric circles out with their families and their siblings. And Bob is talking to a lot of them. Right. And so that's, mm-hmm. and that's another challenge I have with the people that are so deeply rooted in the case is I knew as soon as you know, I said at the very beginning, the reason I took the case is at a, at a screening and an initial investigation. It looked to me like very likely these guys were innocent, but I wasn't ready to say they were, but it certainly looked that way. That's why I wanted to see if they got it wrong. Then we want to check it. And so now we started broadcasting November 1st, started investigating three or four months before that. And however, six, seven months now into the investigation and where we're at now, at some point for me, at some point I've got to take a side and give you my, as an investigator, What's my opinion? If I was investigating this case at this point in my investigation, I would be ruling them out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but as soon as I say that, it's, see, told you you were biased. Right, that's, yeah, totally. That's, I, that's I, my I, analysis of the evidence right. is that there's, yeah. there is if no evidence. If he was a reporter, <clears throat> then maybe you're right. If he's just reporting, all right, then report the investigation. But he's actually investigating. So by doing that, you, you literally have to go where the evidence takes you. If sure. the evidence took him to one guy or another guy or all three of those guys or somebody totally different, he has to go there. You sure. can't simply keep an open mind throughout the whole thing because at some point the evidence tells you where to go and you go there. Right. And so let's circle back a little bit um, to, you know, you're putting together the victimology and you're looking at what the police investigation, what, what they did at the time. Mm-hmm. And you're clearly finding some gaps um, right. You know, simple things about the family, the victimology. And I think we established through our real crime profile episodes, there seemed to be very little done around the victimology mm-hmm. um, at the time. So, you know, the family dynamics, um, where the families that the boys came from. And, you know, I was interested to hear that with Michael Moore, that his family weren't quite the family that I was huge, yeah. led to believe that they were. Right. Can you say a little bit about that? If we Just believe, your... if, if we believe that interview, you right? Had well, and and, I, and I've had some done some other interviews, and 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 there there's, I'll say this: I believe Don Moore from what she said. There's there's some evidence that corroborates that, and it's important not because I think that that the Moors had anything to do with the murders. It's important because it it affects victimology because you know we're trying to figure out how how would Michael Moore act react what was his behavior like well. When, when we compare that to the, the, the kid that lives in the perfect home with the perfect mommy and daddy and everything is, 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 is this wonderful little life, he may be a kid that would react differently to violence or to a threat as opposed to a kid that grows, grew up in a household with two alcoholics that were either absentee or when they were there, they were abusive. That kid is going to react differently. And so it, it is important for me when in assessing the victimology. Right. And also be exposed to a different set of potential offenders. So exactly. And know. leaving the home or being on his own a lot. And you mm-hmm. know, when he's where he spends his time, if he's being left alone at home a lot, then he may well be spending more time with his friends and therefore the bond is closer. And therefore if one of them wants to run away, mm-hmm. you know, the kind of the question about were they running away from something or someone mm-hmm. um, you know, at that time, I think is critical. So it's like peeling an onion. You, know, exactly. you start to see very different things as you peel away the layers. And it, it just struck me that some of the family dynamics, you know, really are critical in, in a case like this of what were the boys doing out, who's, who actually saw them, the timeline. It sounds like you've pushed some of the times mm-hmm. as well, which I'm hoping you'll, you'll say something about that. The last time the boys were seen, you know, and some of the people that you've interviewed as to when you think, uh, you know, the boys were attacked and, and killed and how that plays into people's alibis. Yeah, well, I mean, I think most people agree that the last time they were seen was at, at really close to 6.30. There's a, there's a cluster of witness accounts that saw the boys together going into the Robin Hood Woods at the end of 14th Street, right about 6.30. Um, some say there were three boys, some say there were four, uh, but they, they went in right then. And, and then we have witness accounts from... You know, we, we have you know, Regina Meek at the, the pipe bridge, the officer at 830. Um, and then shortly after that, we have, as we mentioned on our show, David Jacoby is down there with a group of the teenagers searching, sees the muddy footprint, sees the bike track stop, no bikes. 
So in that, that was around between 8, 30, 45 based on our interview with him. So, it, so that tells us the, the murders I believe had to occur between six 30 and eight 30. Um, and, and based on the footprints, the murderer had already, if those were indeed the murderer re- retreating from the crime scene, that, that the bikes were in the water, the bodies were concealed and, and they had walked back across the pipe and retreated into the neighborhood by eight 30 uh, I, I, to me, I'm, I, my assumption is the time of death would be closer somewhere to between seven and eight. Personally, I think the boys likely were were killed shortly after they got into the woods, based on the fact that I think that they were they were running from something, um, and, and they could have gotten in there and, and hidden for a little while. But it's a very small patch of woods. Something or someone. Either, um, probably someone. Uh, but there is such close proximity to the houses next to them, the Blue Beacon truck wash and the service road. Everything was right there. Um, it, it would seem to me that that during the course of attack, that if, if they had uh, escaped, there were, there wasn't a lot of space in there in, in those woods. If they if they were still moving, trying to get somewhere that they could have kept going, I think that somebody followed right in behind them, and the attacks happened very quickly. They got right into the body concealments, and then on their way out through the bikes in the water, and they continued out. If you're a fan of Real Crime Profile, then you probably love true crime. If so, then let me tell you about a new podcast. When you think of a criminal, what do you picture? Do you picture a murderer, a gangster, a thief? But do you picture a woman? Probably not. That's why you should check out the new podcast, Female Criminals. Every week, the hosts of Female Criminals examine the stories and motivations of the women behind some of the world's most dangerous crimes. Each episode analyzes these women to better understand their motives, and the hosts dive deep into the lives of these infamous female criminals, providing listeners with each woman's backstory and details of her crime. You can check out episodes on The Cocaine Goddess now, and with a new episode coming out every Wednesday, you can expect episodes on Eileen Wernos, Mata Hari, and much, much more. So visit Apple Podcasts, Tune in, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts and search for Female Criminals. That's F-E-M-A-L-E-C-R-I-M-I-N-A-L-S. Or visit parcast.com slash criminals to start listening now. That's parcast, P-A-R-C-A-S-T, dot com slash criminals to listen now. If you love this podcast, I'm sure you're looking for other great true crime podcasts to listen to. Wondery, the network behind this show, has other podcasts for you, especially if you love the way we tell stories here on Real Crime Profile. Great shows like Best Case, Worst Case, Locked Up Abroad, and Hollywood and Crime. All of them are amazing storytellers that you're going to love. So if you're looking for more variation in your podcast like true crime, entertainment, or audio dramas, they're all available from Wondery. Just head to apple.co forward slash Wondery. That's apple.co slash Wondery. Or if you're an Android user, head to Wondery.fm. West Memphis has been described as a small town, but that's not exactly accurate. I would describe it as a small city. In 1993, the population of West Memphis was somewhere between 25 and 30,000 people. The neighborhood where the events in question occurred is about a three-quarter mile square. Right, and the geography is very interesting. You know, as Jim and I know, you can look at pictures, and and we did pull it up on Google Mm -hmm. Maps, and we had a look at it, and we didn't realize actually how close it was to the truck stop and the main road. Right. But you've been boots on the ground and have seen it for yourself. Literally through a rock from the dead end to the discovery site, which is not there. You know, they, they, they plowed that over, but the place where the discovery site was, um, we actually videoed it, Mike. I was talking to Mike when we were on the. I was like, "Geez, you could throw a rock at it." He said, "Well, can you?" And we, it is that head, close, right. and that's from the end of the dead end. There's a house beyond that in there. I mean, the backyard is less than 100 feet away from where the bodies were found. Um, so I, I, I think that it happened very quickly. I think that um, and that that gave. Some Why is it that you don't think that they came across somebody there, whoever it was, doing something that they should not have seen? Or you know something like that, and then they were. I think killed. that's possible. Okay. I don't think that's that's out of the question. the The only reason that leans me uh, away from that, and, and I'd like to hear Lauren and Jim weigh in on that, is 
is the the meticulous body concealment and the the crime scene concealment. If they stumbled across a stranger in that location and they and they killed them, I don't I don't think we would have seen the level of body. I think they would have just gotten out of there. Right. I don't think it was. I don't mean a stranger. Yeah. But if they stumbled across also somebody they knew, certainly that 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 is possible. I I, I have not ruled that out at all. It just with the, with the other things we've learned with the other with the victimology, we know. This is what I was saying. It's a, a very small patch of woods with no reason to be in it. Okay, so whoever killed those boys, I believe, had a reason and a purpose to be in the woods. And we know that there were people that were looking for the boys. And I think the most likely scenario is that their reason or purpose to be in the woods was to go find the boys. I think there are all kinds of reasons to want to be in those woods. From I mean, I don't know if you've come across this in, in your things but there are all kinds of things that were happening in all parts of those woods oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah they're, they're especially on the on the south side of the pipe mm-hmm. um there's more but then also in in that part of the pipe wood. so we actually interviewed a guy um that lived in the apartments right there and worked at the blue beacon truck and wash walked past there yeah yeah no, are they yeah. the mayflower apartment mayfair yes yep. mayfair mayflower. <laughs> <laughs> i'm giving it a new name yeah. Mayflower. But, uh, yeah i mean i thought that was interesting too and you know the point i was going to make is a picture paints a thousand words but going mm-hmm. to the scene paints a million and right and when you're stood there as jim and i have done at, at many scenes mm-hmm. and we see things that we just would never have imagined right that tells us about decision making and it that's the like, most unfortunate part about this one is that the creek isn't there anymore uh, because I've done that in many, in, in every case we've worked too, is to go to the crime scene and, and exactly right. Even the, non- I remember going to the burial site um, in the Anansi Ed in the serial case in season one and, and trying to, trying to piece all of that together. And then there's a particular place we thought, well, they, I think they were here, but then why would they use this for the burial site until we physically drove it? Mm-hmm. And we, and it was like, guess why would they pick that spot? And it's like, well, you're going, you're going, you're going, there's houses here, there's lights here, there's building here. And the very first place you come to, if you're coming from that way, where you can get off the road and there's no lights or houses around is exactly where the body was. Right. We heard that before. <laughs> yeah, we've seen that a few times, yeah. but more so in a case, well, more recently, that, that yeah. was very significant. And I think that kind of, uh, those apartments, um, the house to house hadn't been done thoroughly. Right. It, it sounds like, and we also see that in a lot of inquiries that maybe a door knocks done once and someone doesn't answer and therefore somebody doesn't go back. They and never they go back, right. Double check and corroborate. And unfortunately, the apartments that were right there that were the closest to the crime scene, uh, it, it seems that they were never canvassed because the, the Robert Posey lived in those building, in that building. And he said afterwards, him and the other neighbors were talking about it and none of them had, had talked to the police. Uh, and so it's like the fact that they didn't take the time to make sure they got, because those were all those apartments were all two story townhouses. So, you know, they had windows that would look right down onto the pipe bridge. Right. And so this is the same, this is the Bobby Posey that Chris told he was running away. Well, this is Where Bobby Posey. Where did you find Posey. this? I, I never. This is I, Bobby Posey's brother. Okay. Uh, Robert. Right, Posey, right, right, yes. Not to be confused. Not to be, yes. yeah, both Bobby Lee Posey and Robert Lee Posey, their parents didn't have much of a uh, imagination with names. Um, but where did you find that testimony of Bobby Posey that... It's in the Chris, door-to-door police notes. That, but that Chris came over mm-hmm. and and said that he's running away. Exactly. When the police were going door-to-door, then there was this note where they talked to um, a Carlos Seals and Bobby. It's a little confusing if they were talking to Carlos and Bobby or talking okay. to Bobby at Carlos's house, but it says that... Chris came over and said that his daddy whipped him and he was running away. And then later his dad came and, and told him that, well, I'm going to have to whip him again. Where's he at? I saw him over here. Uh, and that was then, you know, when, when I interviewed John Mark Byers earlier that last year, you know, he told me to say that when he was looking, we stopped by, we stopped by some kid named Carlos's house, which is funny because at the time I didn't know who that was. Right. But then that's one of those, you know, the, the tips that are corroborated by one or one another. Sure. So here's 25 years ago. Uh, Carlos Seal saying he stops by and says, I'm going to have to whip him again. And then 25 years later, John's telling me that you know, he stopped by this kid named Carlos's house. Of course, he didn't tell me he told him he was going to whip him again. He just said he Exactly. Was know. that ever in the trial? I just, I just never, no. heard it. it was, there was no reason to bring it up, but that was such, such an no, interesting little detail. That no, you know. because they weren't looking. <laughs> oh, I know, but they put him on the stand. They put Mark Byers on the stand. Well, the, and they, the, the defense you know. did. I don't think, I don't think the defense did a, you know, they, I don't know if they have the resources. Well, there's also the discovery mess and in in, a lot of people aren't aware of. Uh, it's laid out very well in Marl Everett's book, The Devil Not, Devil's Not, um, in how the, the prosecution piecemealed the discovery in this case 
to the defense little bits at a time over months and months and months. Finally, in in August, the judge put a deadline in August. They have to have everything. And they didn't get John Mark Byer's statement until December. And it was just the prosecution was and they they the defense claims they were intentionally mixing everything was in no chronological order nothing just giving them thousands of pages slowly instead of just turning the whole file over to them which made the the defense's job very difficult but you know john mark byers was always kind of uh many people aren't aware of the fact that he was actually a criminal informant for west memphis pd and memphis had relationships with all the police officers had multiple charges and other, you know, through, oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that were that were disappeared from his record, terroristic threats and, and he had a domestic that, violence complaint, I think, at one point. Yeah, and I, I think it was it had to do with a stun gun and his ex-wife. I think they called it a terroristic threat, uh, but the charges over were, were disappeared. He was arrested another time on some kind of drug charge, and there were federal um, agencies that came in and took him out and dropped it from his record, and he was never never looked into. By the West Memphis, but you know the, the the father of one of the victims. He was never investigated. Well, none of them were they were they, and that mm-hmm. that again is one of the major problems with this case. That you know, not just understand well the lack of understanding about victimology, but none of the parents were questioned right from the start, separated out and questioned mm-hmm. um, or alibied. And of course, the the neighbourhood where Stevie branch came from that wasn't canvassed either not at all no which is a you know there are major holes here right right from the the beginning and of course if uh, you know a suspect and in inverted commas comes in because they think it's a ritualistic satanic type case because of some of the injuries that maybe haven't been interpreted correctly maybe then maybe <laughs> yeah. when i was going to yeah. come to 510 um the medical evidence review because i thought that was one of the best ev- you know the best episodes um, just laying out, you know, who the experts were and what their training was and mm-hmm. uh, some of the issues around the the omissions, you know, of what you would expect to see in an autopsy report right. about each and every injury being detailed specifically. I'm um, certainly not a pathologist saying, well, if I did that, it would go into the hundreds of pages. I mean, that, that's the point <laughs> of their job, yeah. is it not, to get into the detail yeah. and specifically detail what those injuries were. And then it's the interpretation. Right. Um, but, you know, Dr. Werner Spitz, who we know well, obviously weighed in on this case and um, had some uh, controversial things to say in, in some respects. I know mm-hmm. you don't agree with everything that he said and the dog bite aspect of, you know, him saying maybe dogs, but maybe not considering turtles mm-hmm. of that specific area at the time. Right. Which I thought, you know, you made a, a point. It was a bit tongue in cheek. You know, the area was called Turtle Hill. Right, which might yeah. give a nod to the animal that you might yeah. find in there that most prominently. Yes. Habitat. Yeah, that that we caught a lot of flack for that episode, and, and we knew we would as soon as we started really laying down any evidence that was going against the idea that you know that three were were possibly guilty. Um, yeah, and with, with Warner Spitz, you know, he kept mentioning a dog, and and I don't, but but you know, he, he I don't think he, well, I think he at some point did say that I think probably a dog, um, but. Again, he I think he even said on the stand that he hadn't really considered turtles or looked into turtles. And, you know, those alligator snapping turtles with the big mouths and claws that would come in that looked just like fangs coming oh, into yeah, bone. I mean, right. But turtle turtle claws on their hands, mm-hmm. I mean, they, they can scratch the hell, rip the, the hell out the of people. The experiment that you did was amazing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the chickens being left and then the pigs mm-hmm. and having cameras in the water to, right. to see and document what it would look like. Well, and that was my larger point was, you know, I'm, I'm in no position to question Dr. Warner Spitz or Dr. Frank Peretti. I'm not, you know, so I, I do my best to analyze. I did you know, buy a copy of, of Spitz's book because when I was, you know, the claim that some people were making is that, you know, he's a sellout and he'll say whatever, you know, wherever the money goes, which I think is complete BS. But so what I'm doing to analyze that is, is I'm not going to be a medical expert, but what I want to know is what he's saying now consistent with what he's always taught and that's why i got the book and i was and i'm going through finding by finding and okay oh maybe he's wrong but he's not lying he's not always yeah. he's always said that this means this right um but the, but the, the experiment the, the greater point that i was trying to make is okay let's concede that maybe not every injury on there is post-mortem turtle activity but the other side which they won't but needs to concede the fact that it is impossible to put a a a dead body into any body of water for 18 hours in Arkansas overnight 
and not have them pred- uh, had, have predators chew on them. Right. It's insane to think that no- – and there there were people who say that none of that. It's all stabbing, weird little stabbings with a knife. But you can't put – we put the, that ch- first chicken in the water and we're stunned. We're like, well, let's see what happened because we didn't see any turtles. Throw the chicken in the water and we leave and then we come back, you know, two hours later and just see the chicken jerked all over under the water and pull up a bag of bones, right? you know, right afterwards. Um, what was the temperature that day, May 5th? Oh, yeah. Oh, good, good Lord. That's a hard question. Um, so there's several different sources that give different temperature readings. Uh, the, the reading that I found in Weather Underground was that it was a high of 73 degrees that day. Uh, the climatology data that is included in the case file in Callahan says that it was 83, maybe 86, something on top of my head. Um, but that was a weather station out of Memphis, across, which is 20 minutes away, but across the, the bridge uh, of the Mississippi. The other one was from West Memphis. It's, it's really convoluted and conflicted. I don't really know at this point. We thought we had it figured out between what wet bulb and dry bulb temperatures were. Apparently, it turns out I'm not a climatologist and don't actually know what those things mean. It's somewhere between 73 and 83 okay. was the high temperature. And then, Lisa, you said before there was a lot of things going on in those woods. What, mm-hmm. what kinds of things? I mean, if memory serves me correct, um, I'd have to get, you know, I, I can't quote exactly the pages I'm thinking of, but there's a lot of drug trafficking going on. There's a lot of prostitution going on. There's probably a lot of... Um, homosexual sex going on in those woods. Um, people just going out there to do things that they don't want people to see and don't want people to know about. And do kids ever go swimming in that, that stream? They do. Um, it, it wasn't super common. There's not always water in that stream to begin with. But there was at that point. At that point there yeah, was. Sure. Um, it's pretty nasty, dirty water. It looks like about chocolate milk because um, it only comes through when there's, high, when there's heavy rains is when it fills up. But uh, Christopher Byer's brother, Ryan Clark, did write an affidavit at one point where he said he had swam um, back there before. Typically, if the kids were going to swim, they would do it in the bayou, the main body of water, by the pipe, and not in that little tributary back there. But if they wanted to hide while they were doing it, yeah, would they go back there? Uh, Do I think they went back there, or could kids hide back there and swim? Yes, they could. Okay, and then, so I would say... When we were talking about how to control these kids, if these kids were in the water, first of all, they're eight years old. Mm -hmm. And kids, eight years old, running in water versus an adult running in that water. I mean, it could be the way they were corralled. If they were in the water, if they were playing around. And to me, it's much more plausible that they took off their clothes to go swimming, whether they were skinny dipping or whether they were wearing their underwear or Mm -hmm. whatever. To me, that's a more plausible reason for them to be naked than the offender having to take them off and everything. But if they were in the water and messing around and then they got cornered in that water, it would be very hard for them to run away. And it'd be very easy for an adult who stands taller in the water Mm -hmm. to catch them, overpower them and just corral them and hold them down. Sure. I've never never heard of that one. I've never heard of that theory before. A lot of the kids that were interviewed in that neighborhood did say that they would play in those woods and they would hide in those woods and they had a clubhouse and they had, so, you know, I think people were in and out of there. But a lot of that we found was, was some of it was being mixed up, which woods they were talking about because the Robin Hood woods were actually the woods south of the bayou, the bigger woods in the area called the devil's den was a big ditch in the Robin Hood woods south of the bayou uh, and that's where they said a lot of the, the drug use happened and the drinking, and that's where a lot of that stuff would happen, um, as opposed to the Blue Beacon Woods. Uh, that some, Somewhere, someone started calling the area, the, and I might have even been in the documentary, started calling that area the Devil's Den, you know, because they also gave the case, case number 666, claiming it was in sequence, but the next one was case number 593. Oh, um, oh so you see how some of that, but the Devil's Den was actually on the other side of the bayou. After uh, you know, after you hear Dr. Spitz's findings, and then you you do go back and look at the the autopsy photos, it's all of a sudden you can see, yeah, these right. are, these are scratches. These are mm-hmm. you know, it's just so traumatizing to see them at all. Right. But of course, at first you're like, oh, somebody must have you know right. stabbed this but, child. Right. But, but um, in in Dr. Spitz's uh, defense, if you put somebody in the water and you have a turtle biting and scratching at them, 
and they are in the water for 18 hours, those wounds may mimic what a dog might do to somebody if they weren't in the water. And, you know, and, you know, there's so many different variables here. You know, the time, the time of the year, the type of animals, the, the, the mix of animals, because it's, it's not just turtles in that water. Right. And so, you know, I mean, Spitz gave whatever his opinion was. And he only has the photos. Yeah, I mean, exactly. he, he doesn't right. have the original. Well, that was some anything. of the argument that, well, he couldn't, you know, do a better job than the person that was right there and, and viewed it. Well, he could, because actually he's done 60,000 autopsies, and the person who was right there and viewed it had nowhere near that. Right. And scratched the surface of that. Well, he yeah. wasn't board certified, and he had, I think he had failed three times his board certification. And then gave up on it, yeah. And gave up. So, you know, there is something about experience, as we know. Experience and actual certification. But when you have a situation where you have literally done tens of thousands more autopsies than the person who was in charge of doing that particular one, you are in a better position to actually review the information and say, well, I'm sorry, you got this wrong. And it's clear. I mean, you know, the, the, the fact is that there is no actual evidence of torture. I mean, Spitz goes really into detail about what you would see, the hemorrhaging mm -hmm. that you would see, because it's not there. That means it didn't happen. Well, and the hemorrhaging is a great point, and it's where – from in my opinion, after reading through Spitz's book uh, on the topic, it, it, to me, it, it doesn't. It's not so much that one was right and one was wrong. It's that one was very basically limited to a black and white. So, if something hemorrhages, it's post. It's it's anti mortem. If it doesn't hemorrhage, it's post mortem. Well, so but what Spitz? And so and so Peretti looks at some wounds and says there's hemorrhaging. Clearly, it's anti mortem. Spitz looks at it and says there's hemorrhaging but not enough and I wondered what he meant by that and then I read his book mm -hmm. and it's because and I think I described it in the podcast at some point if you take any artery or whatever and you cut it and your heart's pumping it's going to shoot blood out everywhere hemorrhage if your heart's not pumping then you cut it and it's not going to pump out but if I put it down like this gravity is still going to cause the blood to flow and still going to cause water. hemorrhage right and in your wa water where you're moving around, it will still call hemorrhage, but that's what Spitz meant by not enough, like the brain injuries. The injury should have caused much more hemorrhaging in the brain. There was some, but it should have caused much more, and it didn't. That's why he said it was post-mortem, because the hemorrhaging that did occur, he believes occurred because of gravity shifting, not because the heart was pumping blood into it. So glad that you read the phone transcript between um, Dr. Peretti and one of the defense attorneys, because we mm -hmm. actually did the same. That just tells you the kind of pressure that this doctor was under right. to find certain things, mm -hmm. like that the boys had been sodomized and all this stuff. Right. And it's just... it's the main just comment, he didn't want to be caught in the middle. Caught in the right. middle? When he's, uh, he's and that's why I said, so why would, a, why would the medical examiner ever feel caught in the middle? Where is that pressure coming from? Right? It is exactly... Yeah, so you guys, if you guys covered the same thing, I was as yeah. soon as I read that, it's red flags that they're trying. They are the ones trying to direct the evidence to fit right. their theory. Right. Yeah. And most people wouldn't know about that if you're just covering the trial and stuff. You wouldn't know about those kind of conversations. You mm -hmm. wouldn't know unless you dig through wherever I found that random piece of paper that had that on there. Right. You know. I don't know if you've taken a look at your kids' math homework lately, but trust me, this is not the math that we learned. In fact, I tapped out at third grade. I could not help my kids any longer with how they were learning math. So I am going to be absolutely no help at all when it comes to the SATs. Luckily, we have the Princeton Review. The Princeton Review has all your kid needs to prep for the SAT or ACT college entrance exams with a personalized plan. And if you're getting ready for grad school, the Princeton Review can help you prepare for the MCAT, GRE, GMAT, LSAT, and more. There are traditional classroom courses or virtual classrooms where you get the same personalized instruction online. And they have self-paced courses too. The Princeton Review uses adaptive technology to pinpoint how your kid's doing in each area. In real time, their exclusive recommendation engine can guide your kid to where they need more work or save them time on parts they've already mastered. So if you've got a high schooler or you're getting ready for grad school, the Princeton Review has got you covered. And here's a special offer for our listeners, $250 off any classroom course in person or live online. Go to theprincetonreview.com forward slash real crime to sign up. For $250 off any classroom course, go to theprincetonreview.com forward slash real crime.
The Princeton Review is not affiliated with Princeton University. It's critically important to know who the victims were, what their personalities were like, what their home life was like, and what they were doing in the final hours leading up to their death in order to accurately assess their risk. I believe that as we begin our journey reinvestigating this case, that there is someone out there that has the answers to these two questions. So since Dr. Switz does not believe that there was blunt force trauma to the boys, that is something that's just so hard for me, though, to figure out how they were submerged. Maybe you guys can comment on that, how they could be all drowned by one person yeah. at the same time. Because I know that you talked about wrestling your boys, and I've tried to get many children to take a bath at the same time. And once they start dispersing and running the away, is it's you, were almost- you were concerned about hurting them. Right. You could easily sure. get those those kids no, in that bathtub. Uh, maybe. But if they weren't worried about her. But if they them. were running for their lives and there was open forest and they and they see that one of their friends is being hurt mm-hmm. and they start to run away yeah. and they're maybe they're not afraid of authority because they've been whooped before and they right. don't want to be hurt again. I, I mean, I don't know. Possible, that's one thing that I have the hardest time with Spitz's uh, findings is that he says there was no blunt force trauma because I've always worked on the fact that they were hit in the head, knocked unconscious, then drowned. And then the rest is post-mortem. When I reviewed, you know what 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 the autopsies show and what Peretti wrote in his findings, I, I believe that he's correct, which does pose a problem. But again, I don't. It, it's the element of surprise. I just, I, I won't. I guess what I can say is it's not impossible. It's not impossible for a, a grown man to get three eight year olds, you know, especially if they're so close when they're when they're drowned. You can reach up and grab three ki- kids by their collars, and they're not going anywhere. But you can also, you can also. I mean, this happens all the time. You could, I'm sure, you could see it with a parent and a child. In other words, somebody grabbing a child would control the parent. Well, it might also happen with friends. Mm. And if if one, if let's say the one that you know was most susceptible to being beat up or hurt by this guy, whoever this offender is is in that guy's hands and the other two are trying to literally fight him off, fight him off or get their friend or save their friend. Or he says, I'm going to kill him. If you move, then it's a, the threat in and of itself could keep them still, but he'd have to then corral them. And And wouldn't there be some sort of physical, I mean, they're not going to let themselves be drowned. They're going to be kicking and fighting. I mean, wouldn't there be some kind of, evidence of that well, struggle isn't there a uh, uh clenched fist? so michael i think it was michael moore i'm trying to remember from oh, head now fabric in his fabric in his in that there's a picture of that yeah. while i was reading spitz's book in drownings when, when people are, are, are drowned while they're obviously still alive that's their cause of death that their fist will clench and they in in the, there's a photo of a little boy's hand in his book with seaweed coming out and he writes that often it's it's, it's some sort of muscle reaction that happens at the moment of drowning, and it's why oftentimes when someone is drowned, they'll end up with the killer's clothing in their hand or skin, you know, scratch them or seaweed um, because because that, that happens that they're fighting against him. And the fact that he had some kind of fabric in his hand he was fighting. And also, don't, we, don't forget that Michael Moore is 25 feet away from the other two as though he was trying to get Run away. away. Mm-hmm. Yes. But how long it, does it take to drown somebody? I hate to ask this, but like, how long do you have to hold them under until you think they're dead or they look dead? Or, I mean, yeah. that takes a while, doesn't it? Yeah, I think, you know, there's no, there may not be any blunt force trauma, but remember, they're small children, mm-hmm. they're tiny children. And even a slap in the face could knock a kid out. It may not show in, in the physicality of it, but because lividity might cover that or, or something else, it doesn't take a lot. For an adult to to manipulate and and hurt and and kill a little eight year old. And we know that Stevie didn't he have injuries, more injuries to the left side of his face or one side of his face. It could well have been animals, but you couldn't tell what. I mean, Spitz concluded that those were all animals, but there were some of those injuries. But unfortunately, yeah. yeah. It Spitz only looked else. at the, the photos. Photos, right? And he didn't get to peel back and look mm-hmm. underneath and see what what the actual right injuries might have been. And that's what's you know, that's what's wrong with a guy who's saying, Look, I don't want to do that much work. 
I don't want to detail everything. Right, because those yeah. kinds of things are, are hidden. You don't always see, and particularly if you know animals have been um, at all three of them. So it could be that one was rendered unconscious. And mm-hmm. Therefore, you then have two. You've got one who's running. You deal with the first, one, well, the second one, and then go after the one that runs. I mean, it, it's all possible. Um, it's a horrible thing that you and, have and, to think about. But and, and there's still, in my opinion, there's I I haven't been able to rule out yet that there are multiple offenders. The, the evidence doesn't seem to, you know, the, the, the solitary set of footprints coming across. Maybe the, they went two different ways. Yeah, it, or, it could be. I, I find it unlikely, but I can't rule it out that there could have been more than one. Well, I think the way they were, were tied and, you know, a lot of people did think that they were hogtied. But you explain that yeah. in terms of what, uh, you know, um, how they were tied with shoelaces. Mm-hmm. And... You know, you ruminate over whether that could be about, um, you know, less about restraining, but more about carrying and packaging and trying to manage and put them into water. Yeah, not necessarily carrying, but you know, my, my personal hypothesis is after looking at everything that they were drowned, they were clothed, and that the killer tried to put them into the water and with all of their clothing on, they they float. So the current catches that they float and arms come up. And I think he took them back out, stripped them, tied them up, balled them into a smaller package, and then took sticks around the bindings and jammed them into the mud to keep them into place. And then also took the sticks and wrapped the clothing and did the same thing. Yeah, that seems to be it. Uh, it's a very, very bizarre way to tie someone, you know, mm-hmm. right arm to right leg, left arm to left leg. You know, that's just, it's just, Unusual. I just specific haven't way. Seen that I mean, it's before, um, but the fact that that he used their laces and then another pair of laces, right? Well, no. What we've what we have have cleared up now, because um, it was it was a little, not quite clear in the trial testimony that um, it looks like they were all the the kids' laces. They were, but Michael Moore's was one lace cut in half because there was one shoe that still had the laces in it. Um, and then more, it was cut, but it's, it's frayed, which makes me wonder if it was cut with a knife or if it broke. Knife or yeah. Cause we've knife. seen the photos of it and it's, it's frayed, but then, you know, the, again, it comes back to, if they had a knife, that's indication they had a knife there. But was it frayed? I mean, after it was in the water or not? It's hard to say they had the aglets, you know, still on both ends. And then, and then it, where, where it's cut, it's just not a clean cut. There's, it's, it's. You know, this one goes up and out like that, and this one goes down and like that. So there's pretty. It definitely wasn't cut by something sharp. It doesn't look like. Um, could have but, been cut on a rock. Uh, could have been cut on a rock. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It could have been with a rock. It could have been a dull knife. Um, you think if it was it, there, there's so many variables. But then the one shoe. Then we asked ourselves behaviorally. You had to find. You had to find a way to cut this shoe lace so you, that you had two bindings out of the one shoe lace. But there's another shoe right there with the laces already in it, or that are still in it. And, and, and that, that that's a strange decision. So to me, that means a couple of things. It could mean maybe Michael Moore was the first one that got bound, and and he cut the, the 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 offender cut a lace somehow and used it to tie both sides. And with the other ones, he just pulled more laces out. Or in the struggle, maybe one of those shoes had already yeah, floated well, downstream, yeah. and he couldn't find it. Uh, is a possibility right. too, and, I think. You know, if you notice how they did the crime scene, they did a good thing. They set up a sandbag wall and then they pumped the stream down, but they were still walking around feeling with their feet. You know, well, the whole thing, and I actually just talked about in this, in this week's follow up that um, Ridge and Allen, the two detectives that went in the water, uh, forensically speaking, you want to smack them, you idiots. When they, when they found the first body, they immediately pick them up, pull them out. And then get down on the hands and knees and search for the other bodies. And they're pulling, oh, there's there's clothing, there's another body. And they remove them all from the water. Right. It's like as soon as you found the first one, stop, do that damning. But at the same time, that's one thing that I don't I don't fault them for. For, for officers in a small town like that have never dealt like any, dealt with anything like this before. Um, it's to pull unfortunate. Up, to pull up an eight-year-old boy like that, the emotions that take over yeah, and all course. they want to do. I really, I, I really can't fault them for – just going through and digging. It was, it was a mistake. We're all human beings, aren't we? Right. That's, that's the thing. They're yeah. human beings seeing something horrific that they probably have never seen before. Yeah. Right. And are well. reacting in that moment. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was the wrong decision, but I think made, that one made for the right reason, if I guess is a good way to put it. So, Bob, 
after all this, and you may not want to tell our listeners, but do you personally think in your heart of hearts, you know who did this crime, whether it's one or two people or whoever, but do you think you know? No, I, I really don't. Uh, I haven't gotten to that point in the investigation yet. I mean, obviously there's there's some evidence that anybody that's seen the documentaries knows points to particular people, but what we found throughout this entire investigation is that all of that there's more, there's a lot more to all of those stories. Right. So I don't, I don't have a judgment call at all at this point. There's, you know, the, the, the profile that I've worked up that I want to talk to Laura and Jim about too, you know, of course narrows that suspect field down, but I'm, I'm, I'm not ready to, to even indicate who I would think is a prime suspect yet at this point. So the fair. Moors have always maintained that the three were guilty. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, Terry Hobbs always has Pam Hobbs, uh, is very good friends with Jason Baldwin and his wife, Holly, um, very much believes in their innocence. John Mark Byers very much believes in their innocence. Um, uh, it, I've actually spoken to some of the siblings too, that, uh, that feel that way. Um, and of course, Melissa Byers has passed, passed away, away yes. um, a couple of years after the murders. So she's, she's not around. So it's, it's, it's kind of mixed. The, the Moors puzzle me. Because they, they're clear. I, I've always said that anybody that can look at this case and say, "I know what happens," mm -hmm. is full of shit. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's what frustrates me a lot of time with um, the social media and the fan page and things like that. Because people are just so convinced. Well, you're you're an idiot because you know this, this, this. It's like th this this the case trenches, right? is yeah. reasonable doubt on every side mm -hmm. in every direction. That's why we're still talking about it 25 years later. There's reasonable doubt all over the place. And in, in the Moors, so I, I understand the victim's parents digging in and saying they got the right people because that's their closure. And that means so much to them that that is, they had closure, they got their justice. But, it, and so it's like to move on. But at the same time, they engage in a strange behavior where they get into these social media discussion groups and they get in there and start arguments and and. and, and, and go on and on and on about it. So it's like they're, they're still engaging and reliving it all the time and having these arguments, which then makes it seem like them insisting they're guilty is, is not so much about closure. I, 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 I guess they just believe it. It just, to me to, to be that certain for anyone to be that certain has to have blinders on. And I'm not saying that you have to see it and know that they're innocent, but to be certain mm. is you have to ignore an awful lot. What's the alternative for them? You know, if not them, if not these three, then who? And then that would keep you up at night. I mean, I, right. it must be torture either way. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, Yeah, definitely. But, you know, hopefully uh, as you get deeper into your investigation, um, you'll be able to reveal things that, that other people didn't bother looking yeah. for. And, you know, I'm, happy and I'm sure Laura's happy to help you in any way we can. We, we probably won't uh, comment on the profile because obviously I, I want to know more. I want to know mm -hmm. more facts before I evaluate a profile because, right. you know, to me, you know, it's just, it's, it's sort of the end game mm -hmm. as opposed to, um, you know, someplace along the way. I want to know everything I possibly can before I make some kind of determination about that. And, you know, I've done preliminary profiles for you before, but specifically for a purpose because there was something going on. But, mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely preliminary because it's only based on what you have at that time. Right. So. And I'd agree, certainly with the sliding time scales and certain things that you're digging up, um, you know, and from you going out there, you've been mm -hmm. boots on the ground a couple of times now. And presumably you've got more trips back and forth with you. Yeah, to, we've been there, I think, six times so far. Oh, my goodness. A lot of... I could, I could feel the mosquitoes biting you every oh, time I hear you. Poor Mike with the chiggers. <laughs> when you describe the mosquitoes <laughs> of breathing them in, uh -huh. um, yeah, oh, I, I had wow. a visual just of you, know, mm. you standing there and having to get the hell out of there before you inhale yeah. them, right? Yeah, I think we should circle back with the profile, Bob, because you're just finding out so much information and... You know, it's so detailed, this case, isn't mm -hmm. it? And, of course, over time, people's accounts have changed as well because it's been, what, 20, 25 years, is it? It'll be 25 years on May 5th. Which we're all going to be at CrimeCom, right, for that anniversary. Exactly right, yes. yeah. Yes. Bob will be presenting on that day, right? Yeah, I'll be presenting on the uh, – it was funny. They, they made the schedule, and they asked me to speak on the West Memphis 3 on Friday night. 
I emailed them back and said, you know, it's just, I'm happy to do it. It seems really silly, though, to miss giving that speech on the 25th anniversary to honor these victims by three hours. Yeah. We said I should move. So I think we're moving into, yes. it'll be on oh, Saturday. Wow. So we wow. hope that all our listeners uh, will come to see us at CrimeCon. And if we can get a discount uh, rate, we will... We will post that on our site. Y'all come to Nashville. Have some yeah. barbecue with me, please. I mean, we'll get a discount rate. They're, they're just sending it through to me, so we'll let you know. Yeah. I know, um, you know, Bob's been promoting it as well. And the other thing I just wanted to say, Bob, before we go into some of our listeners' questions, um, is that it's so great that you're doing it from the victim perspective as well. You know, yes, we talked about the victimology, but mm-hmm. honoring the victims and remembering that these are three little boys and, you know, people get entrenched in their views and the politics and it becomes about who's right and who's wrong. Right. There's no absolutes here other than the fact three little boys were murdered mm-hmm. and left in a you know terrible way in a wooded area. And of course, um, we still don't really know what happened. And obviously it's a, a big burden for you in many senses to carry this torch and try and shed light on exactly what did go on you know, almost 25 years ago and try and get some resolution to this terrible case. Well, I'll, thank you for that. And really, it's I, I couldn't do that without the audience. You know, the, the reason we were able to tackle it is because our whole process has always been what a whole bunch of just ordinary people can do when we all come together and contribute to what we can for a greater good. And that's why we're, you know, we're, we're making progress. And I believe that we're going to make more progress because, and, 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 you know, I get, besides all, you know, we talk a lot about the bad social media and, and the, and the case moving social media. Um, but it's, it's, it's really nice to be surprised how often when somebody will just take the time to send a Facebook message and just say, Hey, I really appreciate what you're doing. You're doing a great job, and, mm. and thank you. And it's like, it's it, it, those things never used to matter. And now, every once in a while, I read that, and it's like, I'll I'll message them back and be like, thank you. I just got bitched out by seven people. <laughs> you. Oh yeah. Well, I definitely want to thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we nice. all want to thank you, Bob, and we appreciate you coming in. But we have some questions from uh, our listeners and yours and there is a lot of love for you bob on our facebook page when we you know i asked for questions and everybody who's been listening and i said you can only post a question here if you've been listening to his episodes i don't want to hear from you know why don't you start with the facebook ones because actually there's a couple that i've already asked you okay um, cool sasha off twitter and and megan i still have a couple more but Mm -hmm. i know lisa's got quite a lot of facebook and we have covered a few of this sort of you know already um so candace wants to know what's the most surprising thing that you've uncovered so far just for you personally? I mean, it may seem like a small thing or for me personally, the, the most surprising part was Damien Eccles alibi. I've always believed, I thought when we got to this point based on what the known narrative has always been, you know, cause everybody based his alibi on what he said. But as, as you guys both know that oftentimes innocent people, don't know. You, you ask them what they were doing precisely at certain times four or five days ago, and it was just another day to them. And they, so, so unless something very significant happened, on right? That day, yeah, at and, that time. And, and so, if if they were innocent of the crime, then it's expected that they may not know. So, so we moved away from Damien's statements and looked at other people's statements and found that you know there's there's seven or nine witnesses that had eyes on him, seven that had actually eyes on him at a friend's house with his family at exactly 7 p.m., corroborated by the fact that they were they were waiting for the prom episode of Beverly Hills 90210 to air. And somebody and, won $10,000 at the Splash Casino that it, night. Exactly, so that would, yeah. exactly right. And then, you know, as, as you know, I, I think I, I started on this earlier, but to, to finish the point was that Damien, at, you know, reading his book and stuff after, uh, um, after he was out of prison and interviews he's given since then, He's always talked about the alibis being the girls on the phone late at night. And I, I started to say, you know, Peretti at trial said the time of death was 1 to 5 a.m., which, by the way, doesn't fit with Jesse Miss Kelly's confession. But Miss Kelly's confession didn't come into that trial. But then the prosecutor, Vogelman, flipped that and in the closing argument said that the, the, the time of death was between 9 and 10 p.m. because he had to fit it into Narlene Hollingsworth's statement. So now... Damien Eccles is trying to talk about where he was at the time of the murders as between 9 and 10 p.m. because he doesn't know when the murders happened because they actually did happen 
you know, I believe many hours before. So that's been the most surprising to me. I yeah. did not expect him to have any sort of alibi. Um, but when you, when you get away from his statements and look at what everyone else is saying, uh, it seems like it's, it's pretty solid. Yeah. And so what has been the reaction of the locals? This is from Cynthia. Um, while researching the case, are they cooperative? Do you have any friction with them? There must be some kind of fatigue in this town of people coming, looky loose coming to say, you know, where were those boys? I mean, I've seen so many YouTube recordings of people just walking right through, showing where they had been, where the woods had been now that it's raised. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's people, there must be people coming through there. Every time somebody watches Paradise Lost or the trilogy or whatever, they probably go. And there must be some kind of weariness, I would think. We haven't had, everyone's been really nice actually, because you know, the, the, in the summer when we were doing the experiments with the turtles and stuff, we were in and out of there constantly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at one point the people who live right at the end of W.E. Cat Street and West Macaulay right at the dead end by the pipe bridge mm -hmm. came walking over to us and the guy's like, what are you guys doing? And it's like, well, we're just, you know, we're working on the case. He's like, oh, right. Those boys, the West Memphis three thing. Do you want to buy some candy bars for my son's fundraiser? <laughs> So, yes, sir. So I bought some candy bars, <laughs> and that was it. Um, I've had people stop me. You know, I just, just this last trip, I was there by myself. I went down just specifically to interview a suspect, uh, not a suspect, excuse me, a witness in the case. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I made the ten hour drive down there, spent the day with him, and then I had to come back. I went to take a few measurements at the crime scene, uh, and a guy stopped by and, "What are you doing?" And I told him, and he said, "Yeah, I was here back then." And he talked to me about the police coming and knocking on his door, mm -hmm. and. So the locals have been very friendly with it. Uh, Mike and I, when we've been down there a couple of times, we've gone into the casino that's just less than a half mile from the crime scene, the Southland Park um, dog track and casino. Um, and we'd go play cards at night, you know, play, go play poker or something. And we actually would record just to get a, a feel. And we, we'd wait until, you know, you get around the table long enough. They start asking you, what do you do? What are you here for? Or I would just bring up, and isn't this where that one case happened? And, and see... And we've yet to come across any locals that think they're they're guilty. Every single one really? that, that when the conversation because we expected for sure to get you know that oh they let those boys out there every single time. All of them we have lots of them you know that we mm -hmm. secretly recorded just to hear you know what they were saying. Yeah. Everybody says you know those prosecutors railroaded them, the damn cops railroaded those kids. They didn't do it. Yeah. Well, I have a question, Bob, and uh, one of our listeners also. Are asked it but i'm curious of whether you think the person who did it may be listening and reading all your material and perhaps on your social media facebook page yeah i mean i have no way of knowing but i i believe they are um, we've had certain people that as soon as we announced we we're doing this case that immediately jumped on the scene um in our social media and started sending emails and threatening things that we've gotten um and it's just you know we have it's a strange group that comes with this case. Not everyone, but we've, we've had to start weeding out in our, our fan page, the discussion page. Cause so many people have fake profiles. Cause we used to, when we, when, when Chris Brinkley first started the fan page, it was just anybody that would ask to join. You just let anybody in. Let's come on in and talk about it. If there was a problem, we'd boot them out. Well, you know, they're coming in, in, in the thousands now. And all of a sudden we're seeing these people that are causing problems or, or that are that what I what I just say is spreading talking points where it's like these long, well crafted, well documented, and incited posts about why Damien Eccles is guilty on this thread. And then when you ask a question about it, they'll disappear and they'll repost the same one on this thread and then this thread. Boilerplate tr argument. Tr yeah, trying to control the narrative. And I just wonder what is the motivation behind doing that. And then we see that you know there's people with. Their profiles are completely fake. It's a fake name, a fake profile picture. There's their fake accounts, and 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 so I don't know why I, for some anonymity, I guess for some people that have some pretty strong opinions, but I believe that whoever did this is listening. I do. I think that I think that they would probably be concerned. I mean, wouldn't you be? Not that I'm some great investor that's going to solve this thing, for, but anytime somebody is all of a sudden very publicly picking the case apart, if you were the actual offender. I think you'd be nervous, and I think you'd want to know what's going on. Yeah, yeah I think I'm so too. Paying attention, but uh, they may feel that they are threatened. Uh, yeah, well, do they feel threatened? Well, we get to get to that profile, or do they feel that they can manage and maintain, um, you know, and still con continue to be plausible and not be shown out in a way? But I would suspect that they would pay attention to everything you're doing and saying. Is it exhilarating a little bit, maybe, for them? Like they're getting they get a charge out of it. You know? It depends. I mean, you know, 
Uh, it depends on the personality. I mean, yeah. there's, it's just not there yet. Do you have one more? Yeah. No, I need to say that our episodes, we actually called them the Robin Hood Hills murders. Mm -hmm. So is that technically accurate from, from what you said? What I don't you know. Cause I, because I get different – I've heard different things from different people. There's some people that say, no, it's all Robin Hood. That's Robin Hood over there. I do know for a fact that the big woods south of the bayou was Robin Hood. The hill going up right next to across the bridge where the uh, by the boys the boys were found was called Turtle Hill, but that was the hill. Um, but I've I've heard those woods referred to as Robin Hood also. You know, and these are all just things that the kids call the woods. So right, yeah. so that's what makes it even more confusing. This is the one more thing about this case that's like if you have somebody a witness saying they saw them somewhere and they say the woods, like well, which you don't know really what people are talking right. about. Right. You know? like going out to the sea, you know, a picture paints a thousand words, but going out there tells you a million things and talking to the locals and picking up all the local intelligence. And, and so for our listeners um, or any of Bob's that maybe haven't heard our episodes, ours run from episode 70 to 72 and then 75 to 76 and then 78. Bob, your episodes on the West Memphis Three, what are they? So we, we number our episodes in the hundreds because we have uh, five seasons that we've covered. And so right now you'll see we're on, I don't know when this will drop for you guys, but we'll be on probably episode 519. Uh, we have not done 519 episodes. Epis season five is the West Memphis Three. So if you want to listen to this case, you would start at episode 501. But you have many other really yes. exciting and interesting cases in season one, two, three, and four. Yeah, I think they're all great. A lot of people have, I, have, have questioned why I decided to take this case and if it was because of the popularity. And and really, it was a, I felt I was there was a calling for me to, to take this case. I really felt drawn to put the spotlight back onto the victims and, and truly investigate the case the way it should be. But I didn't want to do this case because it sucks. <laughs> it sucks to have, uh, you know, 50,000 people of the audience that we have that are listening that know the case better than I do. Uh, when we started that are, you know, constantly you know, correcting you. And in case they're a big help, but they're also a big hindrance. It's, it's not fun. I prefer, you know, the, but it's, it's work. And I think that it needs to be done. And I think that we're getting closer to a conclusion, hopefully. I hope so. Last question. Who is the one person you'd love to speak to, but they are refusing? And what would you ask? So someone who's refusing to talk to me or well, if there is one, maybe there is, or someone who haven't been yet been able to get to talk to you. You may not be able to answer that. And that's okay. Um, I, I, well, I can say I, I would love to, to interview Terry Hobbs and not because I think that he's necessarily the killer, mm -hmm. but there are some questions that I'd love to have him answer. And, and, and if he's not, I would love for him to have the opportunity to clear his name. Uh, and, and of course, if he is, there's, there's a, there's a lot of questions that I think he could clear up a lot of things if he would be willing to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, clearly he is in a position to know things. I mean, he's the stepfather of one of the victims. I mean, that's part of victimology is mm -hmm. to interview the family and friends and close relatives of the people that were killed. And so that would be an interesting interview to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, this well, has been great. Bob, yeah, so great Bob, to have you. It's always great to have you. I mean, well, thank you so much. You are our first celebrity guest ever <laughs> on Real Crime Profile. And I don't know if you know what the word celebrity means. <laughs> <laughs> and we always love it when you come back. And we certainly want to have you come back and at some point talk to you about the profile and, and the yeah. further investigation that you do. So Long promise us go. that you will Long come way back. To go. Absolutely. And thank you guys for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's good to see all three of you again. Yeah. The I'm last time I was in the room with all three of you besides CrimeCon last year was when you recorded the very first episode of Real Crime Profile That's in Jim's right. basement. Our very That's first episode. That's you were there. That was our first so celebrity funny. guest. Yeah. <laughs> that was oh a long gosh. time ago. I mean, that was two years ago. Yeah. yeah. More than that. Yeah. I remember sitting and eating pizza and Helping, helping you guys think up the name. Real that's crap. right. Oh, that's, there you go. that's right before we went in, we had it. People right. always there you go. Me. And so Bob Wonderful. is a part of Real Crime Profile history. Yeah. Yay. Still so cute. <laughs> Did I say that loud? Did that come out loud? Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Isn't your husband listening to this? Just <laughs> okay. Know, like he's currently he's live listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much again, Bob. And thank you, Lisa and Laura. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Crime Profile. 
If you like our podcasts, there are a few things you can do. You can take two minutes and go to Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review. You can also check out all Real Crime Profile offers and promotions and our sponsors in our show notes. Another thing you can do is go to Facebook and like our Facebook page, and you can also follow us on Twitter at Real Crime Profile without the E. And one last thing, please tell your friends, family and colleagues about us and spread the Real Crime Profile word. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate all of our listeners. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineering by Mike Thal. Music is composed by Simba Tsumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107. Or you can go to the website where there's a lot of information and advice that you can follow on www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic abuse, you can call the National Domestic Violence Helpline for free on 0800 2000 247. In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, shelter or counselling, you can call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, on 214 946 4357. You can also go to their website for further advice or support, www.genesisshelter.org. And there's the Domestic Violence Hotline on 800 799 7233.